the periodic table. Dmitry Mendeleev in Russia and Lothar Mayer in Germany independently recognized that there was a periodic relationship among the properties of the elements known at that time. So, for example, lithium, sodium, and potassium are all shiny, conduct heat and electricity well, and have similar chemical properties. Calcium, strontium, barium are also shiny, conduct heat and electricity well, but are less reactive than lithium, sodium, and potassium. So, uh, lots of elements were known at this time. Um, de determining whether a substance was an element or uh, a compound came down to whether or not people could simplify it, could, could try to break it down further. Remember that an element is something that can't be broken down any further. So um, mining was, has always been really important. And during the, when chemistry was really being developed, um, it kind of went hand in hand with mining because miners would discover new compounds and uh, scientists and chemists would try to break those compounds down to see for if they could get gold. It was very practical. They were just trying to, uh, to extract the, the metals that they were trying to mine. But in that process, they were learning a lot about the compounds and the metals themselves. And uh, if they could break down a compound into a simpler substance, then they knew that it wasn't an element. But by this time, um, they had a lot of elements discovered already that they knew were elements. Another way that they could tell that something is a unique substance and, and it's an element is uh, by burning a sample of it and putting the light that it creates through a prism, just like if you were to put the sunlight through a prism and it would make a rainbow. If you put the light from a burning element through a prism, it creates a very uh, unique signal. And so this was also something that was being done at this time to identify elements. So a lot of elements were known before the periodic table was created. Um, both of these men saw that these elements had properties that seemed similar to each other, that lots of elements could be grouped into groups, um, and people knew the mass of, of each element very well. There were very sensitive balances by this point. so. The information that was available was that there were lots of elements and their masses were known uh, pretty well. So here is an example of uh, one of the one of the early versions of his table. So you can see that he's got the uh, um, groups, different groups of elements here. So he's got hydrogen and lithium and sodium and potassium all grouped together. Um, here in group one, and then here's group two and group three. So he would group the elements together based on similar properties, and he has their mass in there too. So he can uh, say that there's something to do with their mass, and because the uh, elements that are in the same group would get heavier and heavier, right? So one, and then seven, then 23, and 39. So as the elements got heavier, they somehow came back to the same group. And then 23 would come back to group 1, and then element 39 would come back to group 1. And this was kind of the idea, the genesis of the periodic table, was seeing that there was, it was easy to group them, and they got heavier, and they came back to the same group for some reason. So um, although the, the early periodic tables were... Um, mostly created based on this relationship uh, of mass, it's now become apparent that the, the periodic relationship is really about the number of protons more than the actual mass of the atoms. Although the mass, the number of protons in the mass generally does correlate, and they usually do go together, although there's a couple of instances in the periodic table where um, an element that comes later that has a higher atomic number actually has a lower mass. That does happen a couple of times in the periodic table. So the periodic law, the properties of the elements are periodic functions of their atomic numbers. A modern periodic table arranges the elements in increasing order of their atomic numbers and groups atoms with similar properties in the same vertical column. So the periods are the horizontal rows, are the rows of the periodic table, and groups are the, the columns of the periodic table. 
So here is a not so modern version of the periodic table. By this point, we've actually already um, discovered and named elements up to 118. So uh, you'll see the these symbols, right? So we know H, and here's oxygen, and then um, lots of these other symbols. And then we get up to these symbols at the end where there's three letters. Well, these three letter symbols are placeholders until these elements had been discovered. Well, this is an old periodic table because these elements have been discovered and named. 113, 115, 117, and 118 were the last elements to be uh, discovered and placed into this version of the periodic table. And now that they have been, this version of the periodic table here is full. And that is, of course, the first time that that's happened, um, at least since we discovered the lanthanides and actinides. So now this, this periodic table, now that 118 has been filled up, this periodic table is full. And there are, it is proposed that there are more elements than 118. So we're going to have to start adding more rows to the periodic table when those are discovered. So you can see the periodic table is arranged by uh, atomic number. One, two, three, four. So of course it goes up uh, just by counting, just by increasing number. But these numbers also stand for the, um, the number of protons. And they go from left to right. So one proton two protons, three protons in lithium, four protons in beryllium, 49 protons in indium, 107 protons in borium. So this number is not just its place on the table, it's also the number of protons it has in the nucleus. And uh, the mass number down here, we talked about in an earlier video, that this mass number is the average mass of um, all the naturally occurring isotopes multiplied by their natural abundance. So this mass down here on the periodic table is not the mass of any one isotope. It's the mass of, it's an average mass of all of those isotopes. So some more information that we can see from the periodic table. Here are some, uh, the families. The, um, this family is called the alkali metals. These are called the alkaline earth metals, and then we have the transition metals here from column 13 to column 12 here, or excuse me, column 3 to column 12. These are the transition metals. Um, and then we get to 17, these are the halogens here. In row 18, these are the noble gases. Um, all of the elements that have a red letter are gases. N, O, F, the noble gases are all red, chlorine is red. All of the elements that are blue are liquids. So bromine is a liquid at room temperature, and mercury is a liquid at room temperature. Those are the only two elements uh, that are liquids at room temperature on Earth. And all of the black elements are solid elements. So um, lots of information in the periodic table if you know what you're looking for. So um, we can also use the periodic table to determine whether an element is a metal or a non-metal or a metalloid. Three, we can break the, the table down, break those elements down further into those three groups. So metals are shiny and malleable and good conductors of heat and electricity. Um, so of course, examples are silver and gold and copper and aluminum and probably pretty familiar with metals. Non-metals appear dull and are poor conductors of heat and electricity. So uh, a diamond is an example of a non-metal. Um, carbon is uh, non-metal and a diamond is pure carbon. So the difference between metals and non-metals is um, metal, like a metal wire, versus a diamond. They're very different substances. Um, and o other non-metals are gases. So a gas and a metal are also quite different. And metalloids are kind of have properties that are in between metals and non-metals. Sometimes they're called semi-metals. They can conduct electricity and, and heat moderately well, and they have some properties of metals and some properties of non-metals. So they're kind of in between. 
Um, the the main group elements are the ones that are in groups 1, 2, and 13 through 18. So those are skipping the transition metals. So we, we keep the main group elements um, and we keep those separate from the transition elements because the main group elements have predictable properties and the transition elements, they, um, don't, they don't fit the pattern quite as well. So uh, we make this distinction between main group and transition. And the inner transition metals are the lanthanides and actinides, and those are those two rows at the very bottom of the periodic table. Um, again, we talked about the alkali metals, the alkaline earth metals. The nictogens are the ones that have uh, nitrogen, although this is a name that's pretty rare, and um, I can't imagine that this is something that you're going to need to know, or the, the chalcogens are the group with oxygen. So these are groups that, although they do have names, they're not used very often. The names that are used often that you'll definitely be asked about are alkali metals, group 1, alkaline earth metals, group 2, the halogens, group 17, and the noble gases, group 18. So again, here's, the, here's a, a pictorial representation. Alkali metals, first row, first column, excuse me, alkaline earth metals, second column. The transition metals, these are not main group. Skip these guys. Um, the uh, row, column 15, these are the nictogens, the uh, chalcogens, and the halogens in row 17, column 17, and the noble gases in column 18. And down here at the bottom, these are the lanthanides and the actinides.